Let's see. Good afternoon again. I'm Jeff Fredersen, field ornithologist with Mass Audubon. We also have Sarah Wells here from Mount Graceland Conservation Trust uh, and coordinator of the RCP title North Quabbin Regional Landscape Partnership. Um, and so I'll, I'll fly through this to sort of save time for conversation. But um, as I mentioned, the thrust of our work was through the bobbling projects from more of um, what has been by, by necessity a more passive approach to grassland bird conservation to a more proactive approach by taking cues from ag allies in Maine. So I'll tell you a bit about the background information of the project, um, then what we've been to over the past year, what we've been up to over the past year, and then turn it over to Sarah to explain um, how the advantages of working specifically with the North Quabbin Regional Landscape Partnership. So in its current form, uh, the bobbling project works by soliciting donations from, from conservation-minded donors who are interested in grassland bird conservation. We then field bids from farmers who submit um, a dollar per acre request that they would accept to, to delay mowing during that window of the breeding season. And then we run this um, fixed price reverse auction process, which I won't explain, I can explain later, but uh, results in all the selected farmers receiving the same price per acre and over time that it's supposed to drive that price down. Uh, this conversation makes it more financially viable for farmers to do that delayed mowing uh, as they forego that harvest and the higher quality hay in the spring. And so uh, here you can see the distribution of, of bobbling project applicants from 2016 to 2020 scattered throughout the region, uh, but with a concentration in Vermont, which is where most of the funding ends up going as well. We currently fund about 20 farms per year. Uh, shown in green, this chart only goes out to 2019, but rest assured if I add the next few bars, it is, it is settled out to be about 20 farms a year. And we always run out of money, uh, therefore leaving some farms as on, um, on the table as, as shown in gray. Um, and this will probably always be the case as we, as we try to scale up and grow the program. Um, but just because we can't fund everybody who is interested doesn't mean we can't provide information on some other management options, other funding sources, for example. Um, and then there's this question, what about soil health and farm productivity? You know, we have this goal to have working farms that produce both hay and bobolinks, uh, yet year after year of delayed mowing can result, you know, again, in a decline in soil health, hay quality farm productivity, the, the um, invasion of some invasive plants after a while. And so, well, the, you know, there are programs out there that, that address these issues, such as Ag Allies uh, in Maine, where they do the outreach, for example, with presentations and signage to build support and interest in um, grassland bird conservation. They provide the technical assistance for farmers to talk about alternative management options such as perimeter or rotational grazing, uh, mowing on a rotation, or even simple things like rerouting trails from the middle of the fields or keeping dogs on leash during, during certain times of year, right? That can um, you know, work to reduce the disturbance to the birds. And they can um, talk, they talk, um, send folks to funding sources like NRCS, or if they have incentive payment monies, they can distribute that for for field refurbishment. And so as we, as we look to scale up, we'd like to have dedicated staff at the Bobbling Project to do outreach and technical assistance, emulating the, the Ag Allies approach, do advertising to the donors, do some fundraising for additional cent of money, um, do some site selection uh, to be more selective about, about what farms we do fund. Uh, and we're in talks with a funder to hopefully make this possible. So fingers crossed there. Um, but other ideas would be to um, move away from that, what, what ends up being a fixed $50 per acre is where, where it's all settled, um, to maybe offering more for larger value fields if needed. For example, larger fields or those with a higher density of birds, maybe entering multi-year contracts that give um, the birds several years of reproductive success, give the farmers some predictable income, um, and then maybe start focusing within focal areas like the Champlain Basin in Vermont or the Connecticut River Valley. 
And so the, the Northeast Bird have that conservation initiative, the funding they secured has allowed us again to begin integrating that, that Ag Alley's model into the Bobbling project. So funding to do visits uh, with farmers and to hold some workshops, um, funding for incentive payments for field refurbishment practices and the development of an educational document. All um, engaging with an RCP to again leverage that existing network of stakeholders, uh, which sort of greases the skids and allows us to pilot everything within a well defined geography before trying to scale up. And an outcome of this work has been you know, the development of a grassland bird conservation network that allows for um, the co production of, of conservation practices, that is, including all stakeholders from the beginning as best as we can to get all perspectives and design a process that, um, that hopefully works for everybody. And so uh, we partnered with the North Quab and Regional Landscape Partnership. I won't say much else here, I'll leave those details to Sarah, but we're, we're in this region of Massachusetts. Um, the first workshop we held was um, an all partners meeting of that RCP, where I discussed grassland bird conservation needs, where we'd like to take the bobbling project, the goals of this grant, uh, much like I just, just presented. Um, and the RCP members could then send that information to the network. We then um, hosted a second workshop or a, a farmer that I met at that first workshop, Brian Donahue, Brian Hall, you were at that workshop. The second one was hosted by Brian. Um, and the theme was discussing synergies and trade-offs among grassland bird conservation, um, soil health and, and farm productivity. And so attendees included other farmers, land trusts, representatives of state and federal governments, including, including NRCS. Um, other nonprofits like American Farmland Trust. Um, and again, we try to cast a wide net in order to get everyone's perspective. And this has turned into um, hopefully sort of a working group uh, to continue this conversation and make progress on um, these conservation issues. <clears throat> um, to distribute incentive payments, we essentially, part of the process was, was we retooled the bobbling project application and contract procedures. Uh, field refurbishment practices could include applying lime to adjust soil pH, fertilizer, uh, reseeding of a field, but we, we were pretty open to other ideas of what, as well if the farmers um, could justify it. We ended up distributing payments to three farmers. Um, uh -oh. Here we are, I don't want to move forward yet. Um, to the farmer that hosted the second workshop for spreading wood ash on the field to adjust their pH. Uh, and this farmer has agreed to um, be a demonstration site and to host more workshops in the future. So again, continuing to, to build this network in the region. Um, another farmer received the payment for spreading lime. Her pH was way out of bounds. Um, this owner, this farmer is devoted to sustaining bobolinks on her field, but she needed the technical and financial assistance to make it work and she's up for up for experimenting with new approaches as we kind of figure out where to take this. And finally, to um, a third farm for spreading lime in a field that had only been brush hauled for, for a while, not mowed, and the field used to have bobolinks, and there's some breeding in adjacent fields. Um, and so adding lime was a first step in sort of refurbishing this field to productive hay and bobolink um, conditions. And which will give that farmer options of where to host bobblings for the season, for example, or where to cut hay, maybe do so rotationally. And again, this, this farmer is up for experimenting. So a good, a good fit for the program, I think. And finally, as we wrap up this grant, uh, we're in the process of creating a document that supplements an existing document, the one that's shown here. The existing one includes, you know, grassland bird habitat needs, uh, discusses delayed mowing. And it's primarily targeted to landowners who don't need to make money off of the fields by selling hay. The new document will be geared more towards working farms, will describe some alternative management practices, um, call out some funding and cost share opportunities, uh, have a list of service providers, companies that are useful in field refurbishment, so on and so forth. Um, so I hope, Sarah, I didn't take up too much time and I will stop presenting. If I can remember how. Thanks, Jeff. I'll just start while you're doing that. Thank you. 
So about a year and a half ago, there was some funding that came through that enabled Jeff to think about how to expand the Bobolink project into North Central Massachusetts and not have it be specific to Bobolinks. So that's where the partnership that I helped coordinate came into play. Our NORCOM partnership, of which Brian R. Hall is a very valued member of, we have been around for about 25 years at this point, and we're primarily made up of regional land trust, municipal board members, state agencies, and academic institutions. And we're in a good rhythm of getting together three to four times a year. And we have a big focus on both landowner outreach and landscape scale conservation. So we thought both of those would apply directly to the work that Mass Audubon was trying to scale up because we are very familiar with the region in which they were trying to to expand. We know who the players are, who the conservation partners are. We're familiar with the, the resource and the land base itself. We had just finished farmland inventories for all the towns in our region. So we had a really good idea of where the farm fields were and even what products were being grown. And perhaps most importantly, we have this existing network of landowner relationships that we thought would be really key. The ways that we tried to specifically tap into Jeff's work started with some initial mapping based on the parameters, the types of fields that Jeff was most interested in trying to apply refurbishments on. But then not only did we make a map, we looked at the list of landowners and based on what we knew about them, their interest, we could make some informed recommendations about who on that list would be most likely to be receptive to even hearing about this project. After that, as Jeff mentioned, he came to an all partner meeting and we hope that would be a good chance for him to get the message out to everyone at once. And we hope that would be more effective than him trying to do cold calls to the six or seven land trusts, although he's Mass Audubon, so they would have answered the phone, but still we hope that would be a little more um, effective. We then tried to facilitate some specific one-on-one -on -one networking between Jeff and the land trusts in our region that are really focused on farmland protection. We had some mixed success there. Um, and ultimately everything we tried to do, we were trying to, to use a peer-to-peer -peer model. And that was really on two levels. First was on the practitioner level. So connecting Jeff as a, a land trust staffer with other land trust staffers to see how we could mobilize our networks and make connections as quickly as possible. And secondly, on the actual farmer and landowner level. So this is where we were really hoping to find a charismatic farmer landowner who could talk about um, work they were doing on their own property and then explain that, spread the word to, to other farmers. And as Jeff mentioned, we made some, he made some progress with that um, last year. So finally, I'll just wrap up by giving some general takeaways from the RCP point of view. First is to make sure that you're making connections as early in your timeline as possible so that you're enabling some real relationship building to happen, especially with the farmers and landowners. And secondly, to utilize site visits. We, I think it's, none of us are surprised to, to know that when we're on someone's farm, it's so much more conducive to having nuanced, helpful conversations about land management than trying to do that in a classroom or in a, a Zoom meeting. And finally, which hopefully also isn't surprising, to really think of farmers and landowners as partners who have knowledge to share. Uh, these folks are not, they're not dumb. They know what's going on in their fields. They're paying attention to timing. They can be great resources and to keep that in mind and not have solely a kind of top-down educate the farmers type mindset because it can really go both ways. And we'd be happy well, to have over talked probably a bit, but if you have any uh, questions, we'd love to hear them. Thanks guys. You're good, Dennis. Uh, what are what have been the results in terms of uh, bubbling productivity? Uh, good question. I mean, we've, in the bubbling project, um, you know, we've, there's been some monitoring done in Vermont uh, that found, oh, geez, where's my numbers? I mean, looking at the density of bobolinks and then estimating their productivity, uh, here are my numbers. So, you know, the monitoring shows us about 
0.4 females per acre. They each have about 2.8 fledglings a year. And so currently the bobbling project is allowed. It's not, it's kind of a counter uh, measure. So it's, it's allowed 400 females approximately to breed a year uh, that produce 12, about 1100 fledglings a year um, at $45 a fledgling, if you're interested. So um, <laughs> as, we begin to, as we begin to scale this up, you know, that's can, some information that can be put into a business plan of sorts. Um, but then supplement the whole project with the technical assistance, the financial support for a real field refurbishment and whatnot. Um, John, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is there any uh, flexibility in the contract to the uh, farmers based on environmental conditions? For instance, I'm thinking of, I don't know how it was in, in your neck of the woods, but last summer was extremely dry for us. So our farmers, uh, the ones who rent fields on our properties, had a real tough, tough time getting uh, any harvest done. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what we might be getting at with entering multi-year contracts, right? So if you have a really dry year and the hay is poor quality, we'll still pay you to not cut it uh, and to grow birds instead. Um, but, I mean, that's a good idea, maybe thinking about other... I don't know. I'd like to hear more around that, like other flexible options that we can incorporate into contracts. Or I'm all ears. I mean, we're just starting to sort of experiment with this and think more about it. What did you use as your cutoff in your graph, your bar graph? It looked like you only were able to uh, fund about half the applicants in the program. That's right. Uh, it, was there any thought of, you know, reducing the amount per acre to get more people, to give some money to more people? Or is, uh, you know, how did you make, how did you draw the line? Right. I mean, it, that's part of the, the bidding process. So everyone ends up getting about 50 bucks an acre. But if we want to move away from that, I mean, bids range everywhere from a dollar an acre to like 160 or 200, uh, if I remember correctly. So there are folks that are willing to accept $30 an acre, which means we can pay more, uh, you know, to somebody else for a higher value field. So how that actually the, the mechanics of that work out, I don't know. I mean, it might be just fielding bids and say, yo, you want 30? We'll give you 30. <laughs> but then having that staff person assess um, potential fields for the conservation value and buying them up as at their asking price. Um, could help to increase the conservation, you know, value and output of the project. So, so just so that I understand that in the program that you have now, everybody got a fixed that, that fifty dollar per acre fixed rate. Is that right? Yeah. So you know, I don't want I don't know when we're supposed to go back, but thirty seconds. Um, so it's Good. a Good. it's Good. a process. It started off as like an economic research project, looking at this fixed price reverse auction where you fund the first person at two dollars an acre. And you find, find the next highest bid at $4 an acre, but then that $2 wide gets $4. So everyone moves up, up, up until the money's spent. All the funds are distributed and that's supposed to drive the price down. So it's, it's settled over the years at about $50 an acre. And that's the model we've been running with, but we can certainly tweak that. And has the amount of money increased year to year or decreased or stayed the same? Not really. We've kind of tapped out at 50,000 a year, uh, 20 farms a year covering a thousand acres, but we put little to no effort into fundraising or advertising. So that's something a dedicated staff person could do. Yeah, and we have it. no, I'm with Monongatuck Audubon in Connecticut. We have no grasslands anywhere that would support uh, breeding birds. So uh, we've been making a donation to you guys every year. Thank you. Because uh, it's uh, something towards grassland birds. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks. It's all on, a lot of it's on working farms in our region. And we have large airports and military bases that support some birds.
Hey, Jeff. Do you want to try recording this one? Because I hit record, but I have this window security blocker thing that come off, so I don't know if that's... Okay, I think I'm recording. All right, cool. Did you get a notification that we're now recording? Yeah, I got that, but then I'm a little worried about this Windows Defender firewall is blocking oh, something with geez. Zoom, so... Well, we might be off the hook. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Sorry for talking too long. I thought I had it down fast, but boy. It's it's funny. I was um looking at what I was running through yesterday and I was timing myself. It took me like two minutes just to get through the intro of what the partnership was. I was like, no way. My phone is not working correctly. That can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's kind of funny when I look at the breakout thing, it looks like most people are still Honest, I think something went wrong because it looks like they just closed it. Oh, yeah. All right. Should we leave? Yeah. All right. Room by the host or participant. Okay. Um, all right, folks. Uh, da, 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 30 seconds and then Nancy, all, everyone will be coming back. Sorry about that. Um, why would that be? Like I wonder, Jody, close it when everybody's back. Can you do you have a button that says close it now or no? Did it only happen to me, Katie? No, only the um host, co-hosts, you you all as presenters went to the rooms, but nobody could nobody else had a option to get into the room. So maybe recreate Jody or yeah, or close all rooms. I'm gonna do it right, one more time. I got an invitation. Should I go? Close all rooms. Cancel. Nobody sent me an invitation. I would recreate, Jody. Okay, just yeah. give me one second and I'll get this. And you could just do forestry, main, mass, eBird. Sign yeah. manually. Sorry, folks, a little um, uh, Zoom quirk. Yeah, let's blame it on Zoom. It definitely is Zoom's fault. Uh, this is not human error. It's one of those weird things of. Okay, so wait, the rooms are open right now. Yeah, something's. All right, give me a minute. Do people see anything now or no? Yeah, won't let me. Okay, so I need 30 seconds. So you should talk amongst yourselves and I'll uh, straighten this out. Anyone else a fan of the common grapple? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Yes, I am. And I had a big flock of them that came through this fall and hung around for a few days gorging on um, white oak acorns in the the woods up and back of my house. Cool. Hey, Jody, <laughs> you have to do let participants choose room. Yep. Okay. I'm going to recreate. Be one second. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Yeah. Seriously, who knew wood thrush was going back to least concern? That sort of shocked me. It okay. hit me by surprise. I'm ready to give this a shot. Okay. Okay, everybody ready? Here you go. Now, now I can see. Hey, it's kind of, it's kind of tough to join because it's like a moving target as folks <laughs> click on it.
All right, so I'll hit record here. Looks like I'm recording. Um, and we were tight on time last time, so why don't we just get get moving here? I will. Why can I figure this out? Share screen right in the middle. Jeez Louise. All right, folks seeing um, speaker view or presenter view? Or, you know, the right, are you seeing the right looks thing? Good. Looks okay, good. Okay, great. Looks great. Awesome. Let's fly through this. Good afternoon, Jeff Ritterson, field ornithologist at Mass Audubon. We have Sarah Wells here from Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust and coordinator of the RCP title North Quabbin Regional Landscape Partnership. As I mentioned or earlier, the thrust of um, our work was to move the bobbling project from what has been sort of by necessity, um, a more passive approach to grassland bird conservation to a more proactive approach by taking uh, inspiration from ag allies. And so I'll tell you a bit about the background of the project, what we've been up to over the past year, and then turn it over to Sarah to explain how working with her RCP um, has been advantageous to, to the project. So in its current form, um, you know, the bobbling, Bobbling Project works by soliciting donations from conservation donors uh, who are interested in grassland bird conservation. We then field bids from farmers who submit a dollar per acre request for what they would accept to not mow their hay for a window of time during the, um, during the breeding season. And then we run this, this fixed price reverse auction process, which I can talk more about later. Uh, but this results in all selected farmers receiving the same price per acre. Uh, here you can see the distribution of Bobbling Project applicants from 2016 to 2020, scattered th throughout the region, but with a concentration in Vermont, uh, which is where a lot of the funding ends up, ends up going. They currently fund about 20 farms a year. Um, this chart goes out to 2019, but if I added the next few bars, it has settled out to be about 20 farms per year shown in green. Um, and we always, we always run out of money and therefore leave some farms on the table as, as shown in gray. Uh, this will probably always be the case as we, as we look to scale up and grow the program. But just because we can't fund everybody who applies doesn't mean we can't provide information, for example, on, on management options, on other funding sources, for example. Um, and then there's the question of what about soil health and farm productivity? You know, we have this goal of having working farms that produce both hay and bobolinks, but delayed mowing year after year can result in declines in soil health and hay quality. Farm productivity can lead to um, some invasive plants taking hold. But meanwhile, there, meanwhile, there are programs out there, namely Ag Allies, um, that do the outreach, for example, with presentations and signage to build support for and interest in grassland bird conservation. Um, they provide technical assistance for farmers to talk about alternative management options, such as perimeter uh, grazing or rotational grazing, um, such as mowing on a rotation, or even simple things like rerouting trails that go through the middle of a field um, or keeping dogs on leash during certain times of year, both of which can reduce the disturbance to these grassland birds and help them to be more successful. Um, and so um, where we'd like to take the projects is we'd like, to, we'd like to scale it up and we'd like to have dedicated staff to do that outreach and technical assistance to farmers, um, to do the advertising to donors, to do fundraising for additional incentive money, uh, and to be more selective about what farms we fund. And we're, we're in talks with the funder now that hopefully will make all this possible. So um, fingers crossed there. Um, but you know, we, the, the price per acre has settled to be about $50 an acre. So we also are thinking about moving away from that to offer perhaps more money to higher value fields like larger fields or those with high densities of grassland birds, perhaps entering multi-year contracts that um, allow the birds several years of, of reproductive success that provide the farmer with some predictable revenue and then possibly shifting to focal areas like the Champagne Basin in Vermont 
the Connecticut River Valley, for example. Um, and so the, uh, the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative secured funding, as was mentioned, um, to help us to, to, again, integrate the Ag Allies model into the Bob Link project. So there was money to pay for visits with farmers, uh, sort of one-on-one, -on -one and to conduct some workshops, incentive payments for field refurbishment practices, and money to develop an educational document. <clears throat> And we um, did this by engaging with an RCP to leverage an existing network of stakeholders, which kind of uh, greases the skids and allows us to pilot everything within a well-defined geography. An outcome of this work was kind of developing a grassland bird conservation network, um, which is important, sort of the, the co-production of conservation practices. That is, in, including all stakeholders from the beginning, getting all perspectives to the extent possible to design a process that hopefully works um, for everybody. Uh, and I appear to be losing my voice doing this twice in a row. Um, so we worked uh, within the North Quab and Regional Landscape Partnership here in Massachusetts, and I'll, I'll not mention more uh, and let Sarah kind of cover, cover the details. Um, the first workshop that we held was at an all partners meeting of this RCP where I discussed grass and bird conservation needs, where we'd like to take the project, uh, the goals of, of this grant. And then the second workshop was, was hosted by a farmer that I met at the first workshop or because of the first workshop. And um, the theme was discussing synergies and trade-offs among grassland bird conservation, soil health, and farm productivity uh, with attendees, including other farmers, land trusts, representatives of state and, and federal governments, including NRCS, um, other nonprofits like American Farmland Trust. So again, we try to cast that wide net to get a, a breadth of perspectives. And this has turned into a, a working group of sorts that we can continue the conversation and see where we, uh, where we wanna take things. And so to, um, to distribute the incentive payments, we sort of retooled the Bob Link project application and, con and contract um, processes. Um, we thought field refurbishment practices could include anything from applying lime to adjust the soil pH, to applying fertilizer, to reseeding a field. But we also were open to other ideas that a farmer might have that would um, end up in a refurbished field for both hay and uh, for bobbling production. And so we ended up giving uh, incentive payments to three farmers, the first of which uh, was the farm that hosted the workshop. We paid him to spread wood ash to adjust their pH. Uh, and this farmer has agreed to be a demonstration site in the future to host more workshops. And again, sort of uh, continuing to build this network. Another farmer received a payment for spreading lime hooves you know, her pH was way, way out of bounds. Um, this is an owner that's, that's dedicated to sustaining her bobbling po population, uh, but really needed the technical and financial assistance to, to um, make it all work. And she's someone who is up for experimenting with <clears throat> some novel management practices as well. Uh, and finally, um, another farm we, we paid to spread lime in a field that had been brush hauled for several years, but not, not mowed. And this field used to have bobolinks in it. And there are some bobolinks breeding in adjacent fields. And so adding lime was really the first step in refurbishing this field to bring it back into a good condition for hay and for bobolinks and giving this farmer options of maybe where to host the bobolinks, where to cut each year. Um, so again, up for experimenting with different sort of approaches to um, running a working farm and bird conservation. <clears throat> And finally, as we wrap up this grant, uh, we're in the process of creating a document that supplements the existing document shown here. So this existing one talks about, um, you know, basic grassland bird habitat needs. It talks about delayed mowing, but it's really geared towards landowners that don't need to turn a profit off of their fields. Whereas the new document will be geared more towards working farms, we'll describe alternative management practices, um, funding and cost share opportunities, things like a list of service providers and, and companies, uh, useful field refurbishment, for example. 
And so I will um, leave it there, hopefully, with, with plenty of time for Sarah and for some discussion. And I need to stop sharing, don't I? Thanks, cool. Jeff. Yep. Okay, great. As Jeff mentioned, I help coordinate an RCP in North Central Massachusetts. And if maybe a year ago, there was opportunity through the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative for a bit of funding to go to Mass Audubon to try to apply the bobolink model in our part of the state. So we came in as a partner because our RCP has been around at this point for about 25 years and we're in the rhythm of meeting three to four times a year. We're comprised primarily of land trust, municipal board members, we have state agencies and we have academic institutions. And as a group, we have always been very focused on both landowner outreach and on landscape scale conservation. And we thought that that made us uniquely well suited to try to help Jeff connect the dots in our part of the state because we were really familiar with the region. We knew who all the conservation players were. We were familiar with the land base and we had just finished farmland inventories for 23 of the towns in our region. So we had a really good sense of not only where individual farm fields were, but also even the products that were being grown. And to back all of that up, perhaps most importantly, is we have this large existing network of landowner relationships. The way that we tried to put all of that into action to help mobilize Jeff's effort started with doing some initial mapping. We used the parameters that Jeff gave us for the types of fields that he was most interested in. And we were able to come up with a list of landowners. But once we had that, we were able to then think about what we knew about those people, what they were most interested in, and which of them would be most likely to even be receptive to hearing about the project or to talking to Jeff. After that, as Jeff mentioned earlier, we invited Jeff to an all partner meeting so we could have a chance to expose our full partner to the project and his messaging. We were trying to, to save Jeff from having to make cold calls to all of the land trusts in our region, but obviously he's Mass Audubon, so people would have answered the phone even if he had done cold calls, but that said we were trying to, to save some time. And uh, finally, we tried to then make some specific one-on-one -on -one connections between Jeff and folks at land trusts in our region who were specifically focused on farmland protection. We had some mixed success with that, but I think that was more a product of the timing than of their interest in part participating, excuse me, in the overall effort. For us at the RCP level, there are really three main takeaways that came out of working with Jeff. And they're, they're mostly around working with farmers and doing the landowner outreach. First is to try to make time as early as possible in whatever your time frame is for the actual relationship building with the farmers and landowners, because that's the foundation for any type of on the ground management or refurbishment that could potentially take place. A second, and this probably isn't surprising, to really try to utilize site visits because these conversations about land management are so much more productive and nuanced and candid when you're standing on someone's field than if you're inviting people into some classroom or into a Zoom setting, especially farmers in my experience. And finally, hopefully this is also unsurprising, but to really think of farmers and landowners as partners in this work and as people who have resources and information to share. Um, these farmers are not dumb. They're paying attention to what's happening in their fields. They're paying attention to timing. They know what's growing. So to have that be part of our framework when we're doing outreach and not be in a kind of top-down, educate the farmer model, I think put, sets us up for much more long-term success and people feeling really good about partnering on something like the Bottle Link Project. And with that, we'd love to hear if you have any questions for us in our remaining five minutes. I think, Sarah, that last point, if I could just jump in here, is huge that, you know, listening to the farmers and considering them in, in the process. I've experienced several times where I come to a farmer with ideas that I have and they say, yeah, no, that's not going to work because of this financial constraint or this seasonal aspect, things that I'm you know, I'm still brushing up or, or learning about all this. So um, getting everyone's perspective, I think, is, is huge. 
does that jive with your experience for folks here who might work directly with private landowners? It does with us. I mean, in Vermont, they, I mean, we've been a part of the bubbling project, but even just trying to expand that work um, with farmers and other practices that they could be taking to benefit birds, approaching it pretty humbly and recognizing that we need to hear from them um, and what they're interested in. And a lot of farmers are, uh, you know, they are familiar with birds on their property um, and what's happening on their property. So um, I think that's true. It's also, it seems to be coming clear that depending on a situation, right, we were just in the main, some of us were just in the main grassland one where they said, you know, some of the invasive species they're either not dealing with or maybe not at the scale at some other parts in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. So even we might have an idea of like, oh, delayed mowing, but then when it actually comes to managing and even Jeff, what you just mentioned in terms of enhancements for the fields, Right. Delayed mowing is a practice or a recommendation we may be making, but there's just a whole lot of other factors to consider when we're figuring out what is really best or what ways can we work with farmers to enhance the habitat on their property. So it's complex and almost site by site, which I wish it wasn't always because it's still resource intensive, but... <laughs> Hey, Jeff, I'm curious what kind of what the engagement with NRCS has been at, you know, along the way here and and maybe what the opportunities are for for trying to garner more of their support. Right. So um, at the, the second workshop, we had NRCS representatives, including a newly hired. She was always NRCS, but newly hired into a position of the state biologist, which I, I understand is a trend throughout the region. Um, and she is really big into grassland birds. Um, and so working with her to identify the practices um, and the processes, processes to access that money, which as we know can be difficult or you know, a bit arduous working with NRCS, uh, to streamline that a bit, um, I think is a, something that we're going to do. Um, so that's, that's where they've been involved with so far. But I think, you know, having that new position, the fact that she's big into grassland birds is, is going to be awesome in Massachusetts. And then putting that into that new document for folks to, right. to read, um, having a resource, maybe like the new, a new staff person associated with the project and then scaling that to the other states and throughout the other RCPs um, is kind of my what I have in mind. <laughs> That's a great question, Randy. I mean, I feel like it's uh, those, there are certain individuals who are super familiar with the different resources that are out there for landowners and how to navigate them, um, I, but not many. You might mm -hmm. have the information and provide it, but I, it still doesn't take it. And then you'll have a landowner and their property, they won't be you know, a good candidate for it. And then, right. so there, and knowing how much more funding is going to be coming through some of the NRCS programs. I actually, when Sarah and Katie asked us the question about what ways could a larger conservation initiative help support your work? I was like, yeah. oh yeah, someone who's keeping their eye on that and connecting all those dots to be able to make that recommendation would be really helpful. Absolutely. Building more of the bridges between practitioners now. And those funding sources. And funding, yeah. 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 I mean, I that could be a, go ahead. I was just going to ask, um, how are you typically engaging landowners? Are they coming to you? How are they finding out about the program? Are you reaching out yeah. to them one-on-one? -on -one? Currently, it's been very, very sort of laid back and hands-off organic. I mean, we've done very little advertising. I, mean, I think everyone wants to probably buy a Facebook ad, for example. Um, did I answer your question? It wasn't landowners or fundraising. Well, landowners help. I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's about to be passive. Yeah, yeah, actually, okay. and, and we want to be more, I mean, at least with the bobbling project, especially, we want to be more strategic about it. I mean, right. it's, but it hasn't been staffed to be able to do a lot of the outreach. Unlike the main program sounds like they do uh, ag allies outreach and targeted and are pretty selective and even refine how much they're paying. Um, I think 
that would be excellent to be doing that. Um, yeah. And I think that all hinges on getting that staff person, which we're, we're working on. And that would be through Mass Audubon? Uh, theoretically, but we're open to ideas. So. <laughs> just want a coordinator, a manager. A, a <laughs> project manager, right? Yeah, just the fundraising, the outreach, the, the prioritization of field.